Over the last two years, the PML shifted its focus of politics from what I believed was politics of principle to politics of uh, power, power at any price. I, I differed with that. So I informed the party leadership about a year back that I will not contest the elections on the party ticket. When they privatized, you'll see a growth in jobs and uh, increase in services uh, and a greater contribution to GDP. I know that solution, but <laughs> if I share it with you, yeah. if I share it publicly, it's probably right. become a laughing stock. Hello and welcome to Winford Talks a podcast where I put you in the room with some of the biggest thought leaders from around the world. Today, I'm joined by a political thought leader, a businessman, Pakistan's former prime minister, and one of the minds behind reimagining Pakistan. My guest today is Mr. Shahid Khakan Abbasi. Mr. Shahid Khakan Abbasi, welcome to Infer Talks. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. All right, sir, let's go ahead and start our conversation. And I really want to ask you, uh, in one of your la- latest and re- recent uh, podcasts, uh, you actually said that you sided with or have adopted, the, adopted this politics of uh, dissent. Let me ask you, what are certain values that have sort of led you to adopt this kind of politics? No, it's not uh, that you adopt politics. Politics is a, a dynamic thing. It changes with time. So I uh, was with the Pakistan Muslim League and, uh, since 1988, over 35 years. Uh, and I'm probably one of the senior most people in the party. Uh, I differed internally uh, on occasion, maybe too often, um, but uh, I don't see a place for public dissent if you're part of a party structure. Uh, over the last two years, the PML shifted its focus of politics from what I believed was politics of principle to politics of uh, power, power at any price. I, I differed with that. So I informed the party leadership about a year back that I will not contest the elections on the party ticket. And then I decided uh, later, which I informed them also, that I will not contest elections against the party ticket also in these elections. Because I built the party in my constituency, so it would be kind of unethical to now go back to people and say that I am contesting for a seat and I will oppose the party. Uh, So that's where I stood. I did not contest in these elections. And plus, I also saw uh, uh, an environment where I was, uh, it was very clear to me that the elections would not be fair. So I would rather stay away from a situation like that. So why do you think that, you know, that politics of dissent within the party is not really encouraged? Or do you think this is also true for other parties as well? Of the three parties that you have in Pakistan today, I think internally, probably the PMLN is the most liberal. And this I can say with full confidence, having talked to people in the other parties also. But still, um, it is safer to not be part of a dissenting viewpoint. But I've always believed that it is your responsibility to dissent internally. Once a decision is taken, it is your decision. No matter how vehemently you oppose that decision, once a party takes a decision, it becomes the decision of everybody in that party. And so are you still part of uh, the PMLN or have you parted ways? No, uh, there's no formal parting of ways, but when you don't contest uh, the elections on a party ticket and you also don't agree with the politics of the party, then you can say that you parted ways. Now, you were at the helm of affairs for about 10 months as Pakistan's prime minister. Let me ask you, what were some of the critical challenges that you really faced while you were Pakistan's prime minister? It's, uh, um, it's exactly 10 months to the day. So on August 1, I took over and on May 31st, I left. I was filling a gap. I had a very limited mandate in my own uh, uh, viewpoint. Uh, So I continued with that. And uh, we had a broken situation, a a broken government. The Prime Minister had been arbitrarily and summarily removed. So my job was to rebuild confidence in in the party and to move on with uh, the agenda that we were working on. 
So I continued with that. So the challenges were basically to mend the relationship with the judiciary and the um, establishment, the military, on how to move forward. And I can uh, say that uh, I was uh, quite successful in doing that, that uh, despite um, um, a great uh, level of mistrust between our party and the establishment, we were able to progress forward with our agenda. We were able to do in the last six weeks a constitutional amendment, which required support of everybody in Pakistan. It required the support of the judiciary, of the all the political parties and the establishment. We were able to do that. We were able to implement several uh, important um, uh, policies. Uh, for example, our first water policy, which had been uh, around for a long time, but never, no consensus had been reached. We were able to, you know, uh, have that signed. And I can share with you that even at the last minute uh, when we were doing that policy, uh, when we had the documents on the table and the CCI to be signed, uh, objection was raised that the word dam is not acceptable. So we had to take all those, I think there were 16 huge uh, folders of paper and change dam to water reservoir. So, there, so you manage things like that. So it's not one miraculous decision that you take. It's a series of, you just keep making decisions. As things come to you, as issues come to you, take decisions. That's the key to running government. And so, sir, you actually spoke of, you know, carrying out dialogue between different institutions. What were some of the ingredients back then that you think came in handy to, you know, lay the groundwork for such a dialogue? It's not ingredients, it's a, it's a very personal, personalized issue. So I think you need to be direct. Uh, you need to be firm. Uh, you must have the constitution and the legality of the issue on your side. And you must be ready to pay a price. I think if you have those ingredients, I think you, that, that relationship can move forward. Right. And so now let me speak of, uh, you know, the economic challenges that Pakistan faced even back then while you were leaving the government and also as the new government comes in at this point in time. Um, you know, while you were in office <clears throat> or while you were on your way out, Pakistan's foreign exchange reserves were on their path to depletion. Um, what do you think are some of the challenges that this new government is likely to face as well when they come in to the office and take the reins of the government? It's a, it's a multitude of issues. It's not uh, one no, but single on the, issue. But on the economic fix. front. From even the economic, everything else uh, affects the economics. Right. There's political instability, your economy will suffer. Mm -hmm. If uh, there's rigging in the election, the economy will suffer. If uh, there's a, uh, a perception that the government is uh, incompetent, the economics will suffer. So all these things matter. The ability of the government to take decisions matters. If you have something like, like NAB, which inhibits decision making in government, the, the economy will suffer. So if the, your legal system is poor, your economy will suffer. If there's no stability of policy, your economy will suffer. So one must be very cognizant that it's not just the economic issues that matter. It's the whole environment that matters. You have to fix the whole environment to make the economy grow. We always have this, you can achieve growth in Pakistan. There's uh, many ways to do it, but it's not sustainable. And also when you achieve growth, you end up with a current account deficit. And then you, the foreign exchange reserves get depleted because uh, to grow, you need dollars. So you have to grow your exports at the same time. I think that is where we have failed. And that all relates back to the inability of the government to take decisions. That's why you don't have, have growth. You have, NAB inhibits growth. We must understand this. So uh, when we talk of uh, fixing the economy, we must talk of fixing the whole environment in which the economy operates. But you know, speaking of the economy itself, do you think it's in a far worse position right now than when it was when you were uh, leaving the office? 
Yes, it's, a, it's, in a, it's, in a, it's in a much worse position. And there's, it's been a, a story of gradual decline. It should have been a story of, uh, if not rapid, but gradual growth. So I think uh, uh, to pin it on uh, one government or one party is probably unfair. Although I must say that that the slope of that decline increased drastically uh, post 2018. So both the governments that came after that, the PTI government and the so-called PDM government, they were unable to arrest the decline of, uh, uh, of the economy uh, in their own period. Now, speaking of perceptions, you've spoken about it. You know, very recently, Modi actually, Moody's actually shared its observation on Pakistan. It said political risks are high following highly controversial general elections held on February 8, 2024. And the IMF is expected to, you know, negotiate with the government uh, on the upcoming tranche of worth 1.8 billion US dollars. How will these, these risks or outlook affect government's ability to negotiate with the IMF? Look, the IMF, uh, negotiating with the IMF, being in the IMF is not a success. We treat it as some kind of achievement. The success with IMF is when you no longer have success. When you are not in IMF program, that is success. So, what does IMF say? Number one, we must know that the IMF does not come to you. You go to the IMF. Number two, they have a certain set of rules, reforms that they want you to implement. And the IMF basically addresses the basic economic uh, principles. They have a cookbook approach to everything. So what works in Sri Lanka should also work in Pakistan, and what works in Pakistan should also work in Argentina. So you have to modify it to your own, and that's where you negotiate with them. But let's look at what the IMF is saying. IMF is saying inject financial discipline into your system. Don't waste money. Have full recovery of whatever you do. You cannot have subsidies. And these are di politically difficult decisions. So you can do the same thing on your own, but when you're unable to do it, you go to external borrower who gives you some money to provide a level of stability, but also uh, attaches very serious conditionalities to it. And you try to move forward. But, but, but that's not a path to growth. Right. IMF uh, will result in uh, high inflation and low growth. But do you think uh, the kind of reforms that need to be done uh, but the upcoming government would be able to pull them off, you know, with... You, you reach the end of the road. There's no choice anymore. You used to have space. You muddled through. You kind of fooled the... Tried to fool the IMF, which was actually you fooling yourself. And you kind of proceeded on. But now there's no space left. So uh, whatever the IMF says, now you don't have a choice. You have to deliver on that. And actually that is the path to your own... Uh, uh, economic salvation. It's a very tough path, very difficult path. You know, in terms of in terms of government's borrowing, we've we've seen. You know, government loves borrowing, does not like cutting down its own costs. But we've seen people like you know Hafiz Sheikh, people like Miftah Ismail, really knock sense into their own cabinets or into their own governments. That you know, we need to pull up our socks. Probably, what are some of these some of the areas which you really think should have been. Uh, you know, put forward on top of the list in terms of cutting down costs of the government because even the interim government, the outgoing interim government, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, borrowed more money than the last PDM government itself. So what would be those areas which you think perhaps should fall on the top priority list of any government? Look, at, it's, it's the basics. Uh, look at where the issues, the problems are. The problem is the, the quick fixes privatization. We privatize almost everything in Pakistan. You now only have the railways left, which is a loss maker. You have a PIA, which is a loss maker. And your biggest loss is in the electric uh, distribution companies, the discos. So fix them, privatize them. You can't run them. Time has proved that you cannot, the government cannot run railways or PIA or the discos. So what's the biggest obstacle in terms of privatizing? Obstacle is your own mind that you cannot put it, you think politically it's a very difficult decision. It is not. Take a decision. Now, why would it be politically difficult, Martha? It's a, uh, railways is seen to be, um, 
a large provider of jobs mm-hmm. pia is the same way there is too many uh, i would say political attractions for <laughs> the different political parties uh, and it's a, also seen as a, a negative factor for votes so but we don't realize that you know look at all the privatization in pakistan have people lost jobs no have, in fact they've created more jobs so same thing in pia and uh, railways when they privatized you'll see a growth in jobs and uh, increase in services uh, and a greater contribution to gdp well let's say you know let's speak of pakistan railways or perhaps uh, of any other uh, government entity say discos i'll have a separate question for pia Uh, but what do you really think if we were to sort of you know restructure them or do something do some kind of tinkering do you think that would end up solving the problem no no we we've tinkered enough all of these any uh, business entity it needs three ingredients you need capital which we don't have you need technical expertise modern technical expertise which you don't have you need modern managerial expertise which you don't have so what will you fix the solution where send this guy to railways he will fix it that's not a solution it is a failure from day one so we must realize we can't if the government cannot make fertilizer or make cement or produce cars or uh, you know make rotis when pakistan owned over 450 industrial units they're all gone even banks are gone so you can't and transportation systems are the most difficult businesses in the world. so speaking of railways what would be your idea of fixing it because that too has a lot of liabilities under its belt uh, what would be your solution in terms of you know fixing something like pakistan railways liabilities are a sunk cost if i was stupid in the past and i made mistakes and i lost money i should not expect a guy today to come and take over my liabilities all the new buyer will do is he will save me from further liabilities and hopefully he'll be paying taxes be creating jobs and he'll be a entity contributing to the gdp so that's what you should you should be looking at there's a i was involved in privatization from day one in pakistan mcb was sold by a committee three member committee of which i was a member and i was in charge of the financial sector at that time of privatizing the financial sector So what we learned was there's a American saying the check is in the mail. So when you do privatization the check is in the mail. Privatization is not done to make money. It is done to save you from losses. So you will uh, gain in the future. It's a continuous gain. So work on those bases. So what Find would so what would you ha- have done differently or what could you do differently if say you know if somebody is to put you in charge of privatizing pakistan railways today it's a radical it needs a radical solution uh, i know that solution but <laughs> <laughs> if i share it with you yeah <laughs> if i share it publicly it's probably right. become a laughing stock right but you know okay it, yeah. so who has been the most successful okay let me start the mother of all railways is british rail is there a british rail train today no this done this done british rail now owns some part of track in uk and some railway stations that's it there is no rail called british rail as far as i know who has been most successful in railways in the world japan was a success story and then in the recent past came china so go to china talk to them they'll give you a solution all work a solution in your mind i was 4 years old we used to live in karachi and travel to peshawar there were three trains a day <coughs> awami uh, sorry uh, tezro tezgam and khyber mail awami came in the 70s by mr zulfikar ali bhutto so four trains there still less than four trains a day on that track pakistan has grown from 30 million to 240 million so what have we done in railways railways has less track less engines less uh, bogies less passenger coaches than uh, what they had at partition 
it's a country of, which has one railway line. It's a longitudinal country with over 200 million people plus living on the railway line and no railways. It's the biggest fix in Pakistan if you want to fix it. There's one question that does come to my mind. I haven't really looked into these feasibilities, but you know, since uh, Pakistan is, uh, you know, moving towards, or is perhaps a lot of, making a lot of strides towards China-Pakistan economic corridor, and is actually planning to, um, you know, come up with these special economic zones. Were there any plans to um, connect these economic zones with Pakistan railways or something along those lines? That will happen on its own. That's part of the, of the story. Because the cheapest way to transport goods is through railways. Yeah, but if you look at the Chinese, they deliberately put, you know, come up with such plans where they, you know, have uh, railway networks in close proximity to their special economic zone. Of course, of course, the whole world, because it's more efficient to transport through railways. There's no bottlenecks, it's cheap. And it carries uh, large volumes. So it's not, a, it's not rocket science. So wherever you are, just connect to the railways. But you have to have economic zones first. Right. Our economic zones become real estate plays. The economic zone in Russia K in KP. The land price has gone up six or seven times from the day it was created. No industry has come up there. Why is that? Why? Because... Uh, it's uh, in the wrong place, number one. It's uh, over 100 kilometers from the railway line. You're adding uh, 200 kilometers of inefficiency to the system. But you were it's, the prime minister. You have the cabinet. Maybe you could have come up with a plan to, you know, sort of suggest some alternatives to it. Instead of, you know... Again, these are all political decisions. Right. So the KP government said, this is where we want right. to put up a uh, industrial zone. Mm -hmm. We uh, do not understand industry. The government of Pakistan has no capacity to understand industry, industrial needs. What is the economic zone? What does it mean? So you have to get out of this business, privatize it. What does the government own? They own land. You go to Karachi, land uh, is 400 million rupees an acre. Industry. Who can afford it? Which industry can afford that kind of money? It's million and a half dollars an acre. So what does that mean? So the government should provide land on lease. Give free land on lease for industry, not for real estate place. Just lease it out at free. Government should provide the road network, connect connectivity, road, rail, whatever. Provide the basic utilities, gas, power, and let people put up industry. Support, be a facilitator for industry. But let's say, you know, we have other special economic zones. What do you think the government would need to do in order to, you know, rope in private sector in it? I mean, we have special economic zones in Punjab as well. We have them in other provinces too. So what would the government really need to do in order to sort of, you know, open the Pakistan private sector? to operate a business, you do business in spite of the government. Right. The government does not support business in Pakistan. It is an inhibitor for doing business. But shouldn't it be, you know, as one of their priorities, if they want to really get to that target of spurring growth or showing those numbers that, you know, here's what our government did at the end of the day. These things don't happen in one day. You don't work for optics. Right. Work for solutions. So what you do today will pay dividends 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. That's how life works. Yeah. But take the right decisions. Have the right approach to things. But again, if you don't have a facilitating environment, it will not work. If I give away free land to industry, tomorrow the Supreme Court will call me. When I've left the office, they say, you are a corrupt man. You gave away free industry to, you know, people you knew. I know some industrialists. True. NAB will institute a case against me. I'm a political man. I probably am able to sustain NAB cases. But what about the secretary who signed off on that? So you must get rid of this stuff. You must get out of this situation before you can achieve progress. So now, you know, speaking of fixing things, you've... Uh 
you're someone who's also in favor of reforms you've been going ahead with this idea of reimagining pakistan do you think pakistan really needs something along the lines of what indonesia had probably 25 years ago and they celebrated their silver jubilee if i have it correctly uh this very last year uh when they actually decided um, that you know they need to go ahead and reform the entire system and they've been continuing with it for the last 25 years do you think pakistan really needs something along those lines to gradually reform the system of course nothing nothing works in pakistan which system works in pakistan name one system so you have to dra- radically change everything not reform just change them no but would it be i mean if we are to radically change things yeah uh don't you think that makes a case contrary to what reforms would do in the first place okay reform but change is reform but there is reform which is called as you said tinkering with the system tinkering doesn't work in pakistan you got to massively change it take a bureaucratic system right what is a federal government officer doing at every tehsil level in pakistan is running a tehsil is running the police system there how many countries have a national police system police has to be local so you have to do massive reform it this system which you have today does not work for you so you should be ready to change it radically have specialized uh, cadres of uh, the bureaucracy in the federal government that's it they work for the federal government they don't go anywhere mm-hmm. let the provinces uh, hire their own people they want to run the city let them hire their own people people want to work you know be a ac and dc let them go to the provincial government that that era of uh, the world has changed issues used to be administrative the required administrative solutions in that era you could work with this system today everything is market based issues are market based the solutions are market based everything is specialized now you can't have generalists working running the country so you need a massive fix you want detail i i know the whole system i know exactly what yeah. to do i don't have a issue with that it needs political consensus it needs um, stability in the political stability in the country and it needs uh, support from uh, everybody else from the judiciary from the establishment if they are a hindrance to decision making in the country then you will not have reform and now you know speaking of reimagining pakistan what were some of the things that you were proposing and so were uh, mustafa nawaz khokar and so are uh, say your colleagues like uh, mifta ismail are proposing how are they extremely different to what other organizations might be proposing in town in islamabad say you know you have so many think tanks so many other organizations speaking of you know we need to have dialogue and everything else uh, but how exactly is your idea of approaching reforms different than theirs look we were not an ngo we were not a think tank we were people from within the system people who had run the country who had been in parliament are and we went outside our party structures to create a voice the only intent was to be a wake up call for the political parties wake up look at you know forget this bickering that you have forget forget accusing each other of corruption how many people has pakistan ever prosecuted for corruption zero you use all these institutions for uh, political victimization so it was a wake up call wake up look at the problems look for solutions so we talked of problems we started talking of solutions there was a uh, lot of talk at that time and people came to us and said go you know f- go uh, take this forward to a political party i was not very uh, open to that at that time but as time went on and we realized that political parties were unable to you know accept this uh, um, way of working that they talk of issues you see in the last political campaign there's no discussion of issues in pakistan no talk about pakistan problems and solutions were so now we are actively looking at 
forming a new political party. So you're looking at an idea of forming a new political yes, party. Not an idea, we're looking at forming a political party. I think it's beyond the idea stage. And why is that? Because I think we all feel that the, the three major parties today have nothing to offer to the country or the government or the and people so what, of Pakistan. And so what might be different that you will offer to, say, the people versus what they're already offering or promising to offer to the yeah, people? Yeah, we, we uh, will not talk of victimizing anybody or accusing anybody. We will talk of the challenges that Pakistan faces, mm -hmm. the issues and the solutions. That's all we will talk of. And we want an inclusive government in Pakistan. This uh, Pakistan, the problems are too large for any single political party today. Don't we have the, the best inclusive government that has just come in to the office yeah, now? Inclusive politically for political gain. Hmm. I'm talking inclusive for resolving the problems of the country. Inclusivity does not mean incompetence. Inclusivity, inclusivity does not mean sharing of the spoils of politics. Inclusivity to me is about pooling your capacity, pooling your intellectual resources, and working to resolve problems. And probably Today, the biggest problem the political parties have, to me, they have zero capacity to understand or resolve issues. Zero. But you think that should only be done by those people who actually have, let's say, you're running a political party, but by those people who actually are representatives and have the public mandate to pull yes, that off. Yes, you must Not have. technocrats. Yeah. No, no. No, you can include technocrats. Right. Every political party has a choice to bring technocrats into government. No, but we have this idea of having an all-technocratic government, you know, trying to fix Pakistan's problems. Does it, does are it you work? in favor of such a does, setup? It doesn't work. Why? And time is, because most solutions are political in nature. A technocrat, you may be a Nobel Prize winner, mm -hmm. but you can, can't run anything in Pakistan. So talk is easy, but understanding politics and implementing solutions is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But let's say if you were to help improve the, you know, the, the, the law and order, or, or let's say you know, the Department of uh, Justice itself, what would you really do in order to dispense effective and efficient justice to people? Would you increase the number of courts, increase the number of judges? What exactly would you do to help yeah. you know, alleviate that problem? The judiciary holds the judges accountable. You can't have judges delaying cases for decades. It's not acceptable. No, but then there is also this problem of infrastructure as well that you know, perhaps judiciary is also in a way... Uh, you know, it's it's overburdened with the number of cases that it has to dispense well, I, at I this point I don't know about that. The prosecution system has to improve. The police right. system has to improve. They all go together. So it's not one single that I appoint more judges and I have more courtrooms and things will get resolved. Mm -hmm. Plus, you, more, you must also be able to punish those who institute frivolous cases. In Pakistan, my experience is most of the cases are frivolous. They should never be in court. But they are in court and they, the best thing to do to punish somebody is to just keep him hanging in the courts for years but, and years. But did you try coming up with some legislation which would try to tackle that problem? It's not about legislation. Right. It's about the relationship between the institutions. What does the judiciary do? What does the parliament do? What does the executive do? What does the establishment do? But unless there is no cost for you know coming up with frivolous cases. Oh, the laws you... are there. The laws are there. Right. They are, are mostly British laws and they work pretty well. Hmm. If you, somebody reads the laws, if the judges know the laws, if they take decisions according to the law. It's, we, I'll give you one example. Take the Ricotec case. Ricotec was a contract signed by the government of Balochistan with a company. It, the jurisdiction for grievances was the uh, London Court of International Arbitration. That was the only forum for disputes. Our Supreme Court took a decision declaring that contract void ab initio. What happened? Six billion dollar judgment against you. Who's responsible? So, I, mean, I can quote you these issues all day. We all need to act responsibly.
the politicians in this country, the judiciary in this country, mm. the media in this country, the military in this country, the businessmen in this country. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive, it's a, it's a massive challenge. It's not a simple challenge, but you have to start some day. You won't be able to fix it in one day, but you have to start some day. But what what would uh, such a day really look like when you think that you know something along those lines can really be uh, fixed in Pakistan? The day you have Pakistan's first free and fair election. People make a bad choice, let them suffer. Let the country suffer. It's the people's choice. I guarantee you, you have three fair elections in this country, mm -hmm. you start progressing. We, we, it cannot be that we hold elections, but we say that the people of Pakistan cannot make the choice because they will make a bad choice. Then change the, change the social, they change the constitution. So what you're suggesting a social contract. So what you're suggesting is that there is a need for a paradigm shift in itself to actually move in that direction that you're very much proposing right no, now. No, it's not a paradigm shift. It's the constitution. Read the constitution. We have an explicit constitution. It details everything. It gives procedures. Even the oath of every constitutional office is in the part of the constitution. Today, when the National Assembly is taking oath, they are taking an oath which is part of the constitution. It's a constitutional oath. And I can tell you, many people, I don't know, 10%, 20, 30 people taking the oath, mm -hmm. today were not elected by the people of Pakistan. There, there, that is your problem right there. I don't, to, I don't want to get into the history of yeah. it, but if you were to suggest something along the lines of, let's say, you know, really reviving that spirit of constitutionalism, what do you think is really needed right now? Respon being responsible. Being responsible. No, what is that idea we, of being We talk responsible? institution. There are no institutions in Pakistan, unfortunately. It's all personalized. So who are there today? There are four or five political leaders. There's the army chief. There is the chief justice. They need to sit down. Adopt that consensus that perhaps yeah, we need to follow. Adopt a consensus on how to move forward. Because whatever you have, whatever you want to call it, is not mm. working. So you need to sit down and work out how, if you need to change the, if you don't agree, if the constitution is wrong, change it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a live document, it's not forever. But it has to be changed by consensus. Change it, yeah, if you are all sitting there, right. you have a consensus already. Let them say, for example, I am a firm believer, it's a politically difficult thing to say, you mm. need more, more provinces in this country. Right. It'll solve most of your problems. Most of your administrative problems at least. Again, you can reach a consensus on that, fine. If not, you can muddle through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you, you know, brought up this point of, um, you know, restructuring the divisions itself and converting them into promises. You, you uh, very much said the same thing in, uh, in an earlier podcast as well. But while I was listening to it, I actually had one point and I thought, Maybe it's a good idea when we are probably sitting in our offices and, you know, thinking of redrawing the provinces. But a lot of these people and you yourself actually come from a, uh, from a place where the subculture is very much part of the identity. Don't you think it would uh, be, be really a bad idea in terms of, you know, playing up with this idea of linguistic or ethnic identity of the people when they feel so emotionally connected to their, you know, local languages, etc. The point I'm that, that I'm really trying to make here is that instead of, you know, converting divisions into provinces, don't you think it would be a better idea to just really have, um, uh, you know, a devolution of power extended down to the grassroots level? Maybe start with that first. And then when we see that the practice has really taken a good hold at the grassroots level, we can then probably, you know, move a step ahead and perhaps convert those divisions into provinces. No, there's a natural conflict there. It's very nice to talk about. Why is that? Devolution to the grassroots level, local government. What's the problem? Has local government worked in Pakistan? No. Why doesn't it work? The natural conflict of that local government set up with the MPA and the MNA. The resources are the same. No, but the problem is, let's say, we come up with divisions. Uh, again, Division, let's, let's say divisions, okay? Right. 
there is no loss of identity right there is no loss of culture there is no loss of language right let take pindi division these are the what the division that the british made were well thought out mm-hmm. they had a homo, almost homogeneous uh, culture history identity language all those things mm-hmm. so let's say you have pindi division pindi as the headquarters i don't need to have lahore in my life today i live in mari my whole life is controlled by lahore they have no idea it's 130 and 40 million people i have no local government i have mna and mpa so when i'm in pindi you have a parliament in pindi which is the local government also the mp is a local government guy is is it's administrative constitutional devolution down to the uh, uh, grassroots level so it, it it can work and if something happens in pindi tomorrow this political dissent or there is a uh, you know other way some other something pakistan will keep going on something happens in punjab pakistan shuts down so they have been seen pakistan shuts down they have been kp pakistan shuts down pakistan pakistan shuts down you can you can't afford it it's it's um, uh, these are tough choices the tough but look at look at what other people have done look at what turkey has done look at what afghanistan did 100 years back there could be one province why are there not one province there's so many provinces why so you need to fix this thing and the federal government has to get reduce its size it can't be doing everything but devolve, it, devolve it down to the provinces provinces uh, will compete tomorrow pindi I, will see right. sargoda division sargoda will see gujranwala oh, they are doing better in education they are doing better in uh, uh, health the idea looks really rosy but if you're not really empowering those local representatives the local governments in themselves even say those smaller provinces i think they will just end up becoming another pool where opportunist politicians might just look for you know scavenging additional resources or just as you said you know probably spoils of power no they're empowered they're naturally empowered where does the money go today mm-hmm. lahore to the punjab government punjab government may not want to spend in pindi right now on a per capita basis they will get the money mm-hmm. they will all be administrative control they will be responsible it will be the the provincial assembly will be the local government and they'll be responsible to people if they don't perform this time next time they'll get voted out i have another counter argument uh you were someone who actually were the prime minister when you were successfully able to and i see it as a as a success story that when you were able to ensure that uh you know us while fata the kptd areas were actually integrated into khyber pakhtunkhwa uh if we are to go by that logic why did you not then support this idea or back this constituency which might have said perhaps you know let's make this entire area into a different province because i can't do it on my own it has a consensus has to create there has to be debate national debate on this thing even on fata i can tell you every political party backed out when we started they were all hammering us you know do this you know we want to do this we would amalgamate fata one by one they all backed off why is that because then they, they realized it was politically convenient not to do it mm-hmm. so all had their own reasons so eventually i ended up telling them that i am leaving in 6 weeks i am bringing a amendment bill vote against it then you will see what happens <laughs> you know politically to you right so they all came back in line and sardar aziz saab did a great job uh, uh, really uh, what did he do he wrote a report which addressed every issue that fata had he took over 2 years he wrote a report he went out there he was from that area he talked to people at every level and every question that was raised by any political party was answered in that report so they had no logical or rational reason not to uh, support the amendment and so that, we managed to do that so that's one thing that late mr sataj aziz actually did with the report sataj aziz have did a lot of things he did the water policy also i see sataj aziz is a, i think a person that we uh, was a true pakistani 
I think a person that uh, we need to honor more. And so then speaking of, you know, some of the efforts that he took and then you and your government built on those very efforts, what were some other things that you did in order to bring about that consensus on KPTD? What was that? On the? On the KPTD. Like what other efforts were backed or put into that very initiative in terms of, you know, bringing about that successful constitutional amendment? No, oh, that's it. We politically, I politically engaged every political party. Even the military wanted to back off. They were supportive, they wanted it, but then they mm -hmm. said, oh, let's let the next government do it. Mm -hmm. So I said, we are here. You know, let's do it now. We will address all the issues. I don't know, maybe somebody else wanted to take credit for something, but uh, it got done. But again, we, what was not done, we said that at that time FATA got about I think 40 billion rupees. So we said we will increase this to 50 billion so to equalize the uh, development of FATA with the rest of KP or the rest of Pakistan. Uh, we'll spend 100 billion a year additional to what their share would be uh, for 10 years. This was agreed upon. And 50 billion would come from the federal government and 50 billion would come from the uh, NFC award. So every province um, as per its share would uh, uh, contribute to that 50 billion. All pro provinces refused. All provinces headed by different political parties refused. So that's, that's their conviction <laughs> to FATA. That's their, so anyway, and it never got done. That, that uh, administrative change in FATA has not happened. The, it's been, what, uh, six almost years. six years now. Yeah. And uh, the money has not been provided to FATA. So they, they, are, they are feeling disenfranchised today. But don't you think it's time now that that promise should be kept? And yes, perhaps yes, yes. it must be kept. The promises that we have kept, there was a certain uh, uh, exemption from mm -hmm. import taxes and all that. Mm -hmm. So we gave them a five-year uh, continued exemption right. till uh, it all equalized. That exemption has been extended. So while we did not provide them anything, we provided them the opportunity to benefit from this kind of a exemption, which is, I think is uh, skews the whole system in Pakistan. It really affects uh, how industry operates in Pakistan or how business operates in Pakistan. Right. And when you actually now look at how situation is within the country, and look at the youth, which, frankly, uh, you know, makes up one of the largest segments of the entire population. Given the gloomy environment that we have in terms of economy, given the brain drain that's been going on, what do you think is really needed at this point in time in order to, you know, inspire hope within the youth that perhaps they have a future in this country? What is it that Shahid Khakan Abbasi, both as a thought leader, and perhaps as a reformist, has a message for the youth. You have to go beyond slogans. I think the youth has had enough of slogans. All you have to do is give them opportunity. They'll but, capitalize on that. But is it that they can really do something in order to, you know, exercise their own initiative, their own agency? No, no, in bringing it's about our it? job. It's our job to provide them that opportunity. But do you think your generation is doing enough of an excellent job? In of course terms of not. Making sure? They failed. We failed to provide them that opportunity. Our youth has capacity. They have the intellect. They're smart people. There's a large number of them. Our job, our basic job, was to provide them opportunity. Where does the opportunity come from? Growth in the economy. It's that simple. It's not, a, it's not rocket science. Right. We failed to do that. We failed to grow the economy. We failed to provide them opportunity. They will capitalize on that. Don't worry about that. Just you know, provide them that opportunity. So how do you grow? You have to grow the economy. How do you grow the economy? Everything we talked about just now. You can waste 60, 80 billion on PIE every year. You can waste money on railways. You can waste money, 600 billion on, uh, on the losses in the discos every year. So that money could be put to better use, providing opportunity for the youth of this country. And so you're suggesting is that instead of investing in in places, in ideas, in government institutions which are not reaping any benefits, it's rather better that you invest in the people of Pakistan. You're wasting money. 
I mean, PIA is a hobby for the government that, I don't know, cost them a million dollars a day, literally. Right. right. In legacy costs and uh, operational losses. Same thing in railways. It's providing very minimal service for anybody in this country. You look at the discourse. There is theft there. You privatized Karachi Electric. It is not a burden on you. It is run as a private company. It does not contribute to the circular debt. So there is a model. Privatize that. You have a lot of money left over to spend on the youth. To giving them the opportunity. Not handouts. Handouts don't work. What do you think is really needed by political parties and also by government departments if they want to benefit from the talents of the youth instead of just, you know, expecting that perhaps if they were to be more psychophan, uh, you know, if they were to uh, perhaps not adopt something similar along those lines and perhaps can, uh, you know, share their very much talent and the skills that they bring on the table. Do you think the youth actually has a chance of climbing up the ladder and making their mark felt yes, in this do. country? Yes, you have to improve the quality of education. That's providing opportunity. You have to give them support mm -hmm. to, get, uh, to get quality education. Higher education, the world over, is not a right. It's a privilege. You earn that privilege. We must understand that. So, people who do not work or cannot work, I don't know, whatever, they do not reach that, that capacity to go into university, have different channels for them. You know, vocational education. Other, uh, the world is changing. Mm -hmm. You know, today, the job that we hear 10 years from now, we don't even know about. Yeah. There are jobs today that we didn't know about. And there's no uh, shame in working with your hands. There's no shame in being a line professional. There are people who are making money uh, uh, driving uh, for Uber or um, uh, Kareem or uh, things like that today. There's no shame in that. No, there's certainly yeah. no shame in that. Yeah. So technology has provided them that opportunity. But my question is, yeah. when you speak of, you know, making the best of the youth's talent, even in government departments or even, say, in political parties, where you are expected to be a psycho fan instead of, you know, being a bold and a brave person in terms of, you know, uh, giving your radical or out-of-the-box ideas, uh, what do you think can the youth really do then uh, where they actually have a future both in politics or in, even in bureaucracies? What's, what's probably needed over there in terms of a change of a culture? That, that is a, a top-down effort. The leadership has to realize that they have to listen to other people. They have to be open to dissenting viewpoints. So what's the kind of culture that Shahid Khakan Abbasi is likely to bring in his political party? No, number one, it's not my political party. No, but it's not a, yeah, if Yeah, whatever yeah. contribution, I would yeah. be open to voices. Listen to people. Have a system of uh, uh, meritocracy. On, you know, people uh, who are respected for their capacity, for their intellectual ability. Like any, any other, other organization. That's how organizations work. Um, yes, families are a part of the political culture. You cannot deny that. But if you totally rely on families, if the progression is for the family, then you have a problem. And is that one of the reasons why you thought that perhaps it's a better idea to part ways uh, from your current political party? No, I, I have no issue with that because I uh, never sought a job in my party. I think my leadership can attest to that, mm -hmm. that I never looked for a job. Mm -hmm. So I did not aspire to a position. I wanted to contribute. So if the political party wants to bring their b brother or cousin or daughter or son into, that's, that's their issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, if, if they neglect the uh, people they have in the party, then they will suffer. So I, I, I have no issue with that. It's a longer term. It's a thing uh, where the parties either uh, progress or regress. Unfortunately, all our parties have regressed. Now, Mr. Shahid Khakan Abbasi, people might know you for being a politician, for being having served as, as Pakistan's Prime Minister and also as an active businessman. But there's very little known about you that you're also someone who's not a stranger to tragedies e either. Uh, you lost your father, um, unfortunately, in one of the most uh, tragic incidents. Uh, that perhaps Pakistan has experienced. 
and this was the Ojri incident. Uh, let me ask you, how did you and your family sort of, you know, cope with that loss, uh, you know, after your father parted in this manner? Yeah, there's your faith. Your faith sustains you. Um, many people go through tragedies. You know, I lost my father, my brother in the same incident. So those things remain with you, but you, you know, you, life has to go on. So you manage life. But the principles of life have to be very clear on how do you want to live life. I think that is what is uh, important in life. So did that affect you in a manner that perhaps that changed your orientation of life or how did that also affect you as well? No, I was a professional engineer, so I had to leave all that. And I uh, um, came back to Pakistan. I had not been, had not lived in Pakistan for 13 years. I had gone to the U.S., I was there for seven years. I studied there. I worked there. Then I was in the Middle East. I was working there. I used to come back often, but I didn't live here. Uh, I came back and uh, the people of the constituency said, you have to contest. So I contested and it's been 35 years now. So it's a, it's a commitment. So you became it's a, a different commitment. So you became a politician by accident, if I may yes, have yes, a Yes, absolutely. We are not a political family. My father was a Air Force pilot. He uh, flew combat in two wars, participated in two other wars, and uh, he was 57 years old, and on the Blue Area Road, his car, moving car, got hit by, that's fate, by two rockets. So, uh, you know, he contributed to politics, he was, uh, he still remembered, and uh, that's it, the life, you know, went on. So, do you ever happen to regret the decision of entering politics, even by way of accident, or do you? No, no, no. I I think um, it's a difficult decision, leaving a livelihood, leaving a lifestyle. Um, but I I don't regret it. I have friends who uh, are much richer than I am, who have done much more famous, much done very well in life. They have contributed in their own way. I think uh, you run a company, you uh, contribute to the lives of a few hundred or few thousand people. Run a country, even if you make a small contribution, it's for hundreds of millions of people for decades. Right. So the contribution level is very high in, in, in politics. And then, you know, speaking of another tragedy, and this is about the air blue, yeah. air blue crash that uh, took place in 2010. Uh, you know, based on some of the reports that have uh, been in the open source, uh, it does appear that the standard protocols that were established by the airline itself were really not followed. And based on, uh, again, some of the reports that are in the, uh, in, the, in the public knowledge, the communication within the cockpit was quite very intense between the captain and the first officer. Uh, and, and again, uh, from what we have in terms of, you know, the examples in form of the South Korean airlines, uh, you know, such communications have come in very, very fatal form as well. What is it that the Air Blue has really done in order to address that kind of friction that might exist in the cockpit? Uh, did you go ahead and revise your protocols to foster trust, open communication, confidence, and team building within the cockpit so that you know, incidents like those are not repeated again. Yes, it's a, it was a very tragic uh, incident. I was chief operating officer at that time, so you take the full blame. It's a, it's a, it's a very traumatic experience, really, for, uh, for yourself and the people who work in the company. Uh, when air accidents are investigated, it's a very extensive investigation, but they don't assign blame. People don't know this. No air investigation, they talk of the causes, they talk of the effects, they never assign blame. Who did this? Because it's never one issue. It's a series of failures that result in an air accident. The system is so fail-safe. Uh, this particular incident, yes, there are parallels with the Korean um, airlines. They had three crashes. Uh, in a very short period of time. And they basically stemmed from 
the a clash of cultures inside the cockpit. So, uh, and this was a, our issue, which uh, I always debate internally uh, within my myself. Uh, could we have caught it in time or not? Or was it visible to us or not? You had a person as captain mm -hmm. who had flown 747s. He was the most experienced pilot in Pakistan's history. Over 25,000. First guy to cross 25,000 hours. The person sitting on the right seat was an Air Force F-16 pilot. And one of the best I, I've talked to his colleagues and they say, who also flew the same aircraft and they said he stood out. So two very highly qualified individuals sitting in the cockpit. And the crash happens. So uh, the corporate crew is taught crew resource management. They talk, they, they talk about these cultures. How that accident happened, they are taught every six months in a simulator. They spend eight hours in a simulator practicing all these emergency procedures. So it's not something they're not aware of. And what came on in that cockpit was a ground proximity warning. The most uh, critical thing uh, the, the, the biggest level of emergency in a cockpit if that warning comes on. So you do everything to clear that warning. And that warning was not cleared for over, I think, 80 seconds or something, which is a lifetime. And the crash happened. So we went back, we hired uh, consultants, we worked with insurance companies. They, it's, a, it's a collective effort. And uh, we looked at what caused this, we looked, studied everything. That aircraft, uh, fortunately, had a two-hour uh, cockpit voice recorder. So the whole flight was available to us, right from when they sat in the cockpit till the crash happened. So it gave us a lot of clues on what to address, and we managed to address them. And uh, I think aviation in Pakistan is much improved because of uh, uh, the effort that we made post-crash. Uh, so are there any examples of, you know, what is it that the Air Blue is really fostering and promoting in terms of, you know, its uh, cockpit crew itself or yes. among the pilots itself? Of course, of course. So what, what... What experience we gained is part of the training now. Right. So, for example, there's a, there's a cult, there was a cultural clash in the yes. cockpit. PIA had a certain culture, the Air Force had a certain culture. Now, speaking of Pakistan International Airlines, what would be your solution to fix this white elephant that we have inherited now. You have not inherited it. <laughs> you <laughs> produced it. <laughs> I, I ran PIA for two and a half years. Right. I was CEO and chairman of PIA from 97 to 99. Now, so, the, the reason why I actually use the word inherited is because nearly every government is almost inheriting. They know, they know, they pretty much know the solution. Yeah, we, we are all they're in love They're quite very with, reluctant yeah, to do we that. We are all in love with PIA. We want to fix it and restore its glory. So, in the government sector, that glory cannot come back because the government sector is uh, not uh, built for efficiency. It's uh, procedural. It's, uh, it inhibits decision making. Airlines require very, very quick decision making and they cannot operate according to government procedures. So government in the government sector, PIA cannot operate. It's that simple. You either shut it down or sell it to somebody. So what would you do or what would you propose? I would try to privatize it. And if somebody doesn't want to take it, then just shut it down. Take care of the people, uh, you know, have, a, uh, because we don't have a social security net. So whoever is working there, some people will find jobs, some people cannot, just take care of the people. So if you privatize it, what would that privatization really look like? What would it look like? Number one, nobody, like I said, will pay for your stupidity. So if you've lost money, don't mm -hmm. expect that to come back to you. You have to take over all the loans that the company has. Keep all the real estate. We are, as Pakistan, in love with real estate. Right. Real estate is not part of airlines' operations. Keep every inch of land or building that PIA has. Let it stay with the government. Now those two issues are fixed. Every aircraft that PIA owns today, this is what you must be aware of, has no value. Why is old, that? inefficient aircraft. They 
will only fly from here to get cut up. The planes PIA has leased, most of them also are old inefficient airplanes. So the fleet has no value. Then you have uh, uh, the routes. Routes in today's world have no value either. Anybody can operate and the world has changed. At one time, routes had value. They don't anymore. What does have value, they have some landing slots at Heathrow and some landing slots at uh, in Toronto. That, that's all I know of. Of course, when a new airline comes, they don't have, they have to go through a, a process before they can get foreign routes. But mm -hmm. it's a, not, it's a short-term process. It's a one-year process. You can fly anywhere you want in, in the world today. So, what value are you offering to somebody that is buying PIE? In my opinion, nothing. I, I would not want to buy PIE. There are many hidden costs in PIE which are not visible to the to a person who's not from the industry. For example, I'll tell you, I would say the re-delivery cost of airplanes that PIA has leased is probably close to $200 million. That's a cash expense that is not provided for in the books. So that's just one thing I'm pointing out. So don't so expect to get paid for somebody buying PIA. So is there any future for, say, PIA to be remodeled along the lines of, say, Emirates? Remodeled Qatar by Airways who? or remodeled Turkish by Airlines? Who? By the government? No, I mean. Whoever buys it has, whoever invested, buys it, has I mean, invested in it. Of right. course, he'll make it better. Look at Indian Airlines, Air India. It's so let's Tata say, came in within three years. Right. Look at the company today. Right. It plays the largest order in the history of aviation. So let's say if there is an investor, I'm not uh, counting you in because. No, no, may I, I, may, I, I would even if you pay me two hundred right. million dollars in cash and give me PIA, right. I would hesitate to take it. Yeah, I was actually serving it as yeah. a disclaimer. But uh, what would you really propose to any investor to do something along those lines that would actually result in converting this airliner into something like Emirates or Qatar Airways or you know the Turkish Airlines? That's his issue. What does he want to convert it into? There's no room in Pakistan for an Emirates or a Qatar or mm -hmm. a, a, a Turkish. There's no room here. Why? They are airlines with a different model. They need you need a successful economy behind uh, those airlines. You so need a successful uh, country behind those lines to have a, a airline. So what you're saying is that you first need to have an enabling environment in yes, place before yes. you can actually. Yes. Envision no. or actually, you know, dream for having an airline of that sort. Yes, you you have to have. You, there are niche markets markets available to you. It's a large country, so but you can only go to the UAE. Mm -hmm. You can go to Saudi Arabia. Those are the two large markets you have. Then you can go to wherever there's a Pakistani uh, diaspora. You can go to UK. You can go to uh, Pakistan. We operated at one time a uh, seven four seven daily. But the yields are too low. So you can go to uh, New York every day. You can go to Toronto a few times. Uh, uh, you can go to places in Europe if there's a Pakistani community. You can do that. That market is enough. But uh, to be uh, uh, Emirates or Qatar or Etihad or uh, uh, Turkish or even Oman, they're called six freedom carriers. They bring people into the country and then move them out. Or they have large... Um, uh, economies where tourists uh, come in. I mean, Turkey, 50 million tourists a year. PIA carries less than 5 million passengers a year. So imagine 50 million tourists coming in. <laughs> That's 100 million passengers. 50 right. coming in, 50 going out. So just to sum it up, I mean, nothing works in isolation. Of course not. Of course not. Right. It's all, they're all linked. Mr. Jai Khakan Abbasi, we wish you all the best, both in your political endeavors and as well as your business endeavors and your endeavors to bring about reforms in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for this conversation with Mr. Shahid Khankan Abbasi. Our team works very hard to make this work possible. And it would mean the world to us if you could like and share our content 
And if you'd like to stay informed about our upcoming podcasts and other work, please hit the bell icon.